But now I just want to welcome everybody today to uh, the Larder here at Princess Pitt's Deer Services. We've got a bit of a treat for you today. We've got Princess uh, Mossop from Basque, who's going to do a, a nice presentation on the conservation of game, uh, specifically uh, rabbit and, and pigeon as well. And he's going to talk us through the various methods um, used in uh, game conservation. And then we're moving on to um, a live that's out in the paddock with um, Chris Potter. He's got some ferrets. He goes out ferreting for rabbits. We'll see exactly how he does in the field. Um, then we're going to come back in here with some live butchery, and you're actually going to do the practical with us. So we've got uh, Curtis Pitts actually breaking down the different cuts you're going to need to do your cooking. And then um, Matt Gisby and Neil Rippington are going to take you through a pigeon and a rabbit dish. And then you're going to eat it. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Curtis Mossop from Basque and Taste the Game. If you kindly introduce me to the chat, then we'll be managing the chat. And uh, enjoy. Thank you very much. Uh, so hello and welcome everybody. Uh, Curtis Mossop here. So you're going to have um, a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation from me. I know that's not very uh, good in teaching etiquette to uh, death by PowerPoint, but it's, it's the best medium to get it across. Uh, so I'm going to share my PowerPoint with you. Again, please ask some questions uh, in the chat function uh, and just give me a prod, um, any of the kind of staff on here, give me a prod if I haven't answered the question. Uh, answer throughout, uh, just as and when, everybody. So I'll just share this with you. So if I can have a nod that everyone can see that. Yeah, I've got some nodding heads. Good, excellent. So, um, I'm going to do a, a, a quite a, a brief and short piece on uh, the wood pigeon and the rabbit, uh, and it's more about the, um, the kind of the journey to uh, the fork. Essentially, is that all a bit before you actually get a hold of it? Uh, I'm not sure how much experience you all have in the sourcing, as in the direct sourcing your ingredients, uh, but that's kind of where my background is. So, if I can try. There we go. So that's me, uh, Curtis Mossop. I'm the head of Pathways to Shooting at BASC, which is a British Association for Shooting Conservation. Uh, and my background is a senior lecturer, so not too dissimilar to yourselves, a uh, senior lecturer in game or land and wildlife management. Prior to that, uh, at a different college, a lecturer. And then prior to that, I was a gamekeeper uh, in both Scotland and in Cumbria. So for me, um, I'm the one that has been sourcing these ingredients and I continue to do so, um, supplying. Um, pubs, game dealers, etc. That's my background. Um, now my current role is large in Bodmer on education. So I do lots of stuff with schools, colleges, universities, scouts, girl guides, and it's just uh, increasing the awareness of uh, shooting, conservation, just in general awareness of countryside activities, and ultimately trying to increase participation uh, of those people. So that's a little bit about me. So why, why British game? I mean, that might be a question that you have probably the answer to. I hope if you are serving or want to serve game, I hope you all know all the benefits. Uh, but we've done quite significant research. Our sister um, group tested game, uh, lots of customer research, etc., and to gain people's thoughts because I've been involved in it. Matt is my colleague who you'll meet later. is involved in it. Our perception might be completely different to a newbie off the street. Um, so why, we, why British Game? It works very well, British ingredients. Uh, it's great value. Um, yeah. Actually sourcing it from um, the, the, kind of the start point, it's actually a very, very cheap ingredient, uh, hugely cheap. It's something we can probably chat about later on. Um, what I would get for a pheasant and, and a partridge and a grouse and a pigeon, um, obviously there's got to be money made somewhere, um, but certainly when I'm, when I'm shooting them and controlling them, that direct cost isn't coming from me because um, it's actually a very really cheap ingredient. It's a really good ingredient to make money on, especially when you get to the venison side of things, which Curtis Pitts, the other one that Curtis will touch on later on, some of the kind of, um, the, the money can be made in burgers and sausages, all the kind of scrag and all the stuff other people don't use. Um, but for this one, we're going to focus on uh, rabbits and pigeons. Um, customers do have a tendency to try it on the menu. It's quite intriguing, uh, depending on where you're based, where your facility is based, your, your pub, your college, whatever it is. People are naturally drawn because it's slightly, slightly odd, slightly niche. Um, and that a good example of that is a country far live. Uh, did two events there and people were just drawn to game. And lots of people very interested, hadn't ever tried it before. But because it was game, because it was different, 
they kind of gravitate to outstand for some freebies, uh, some tasters. Um, so it, it, it does sell itself. And it's good to experiment with. You'll all hopefully have cut with it before in some capacity. There's a lot of negative um, stereotype about game or it's, it's a troubleshoot. It's, it's overhung, it stinks, it's too strong. That, I think, comes from uh, the old mentality of dropping, of kind of hanging until it's green and dropping to bits and then serve it as your parents, grandparents or further may have done. Uh, now it's quite typical for games to be uh, served up very quickly after its demise. And, and uh, again, I'm not have to tell you guys uh, and girls, it's incredible uh, tasting as well. So I'm just going to try and... I just, uh, for any staff, I can't see the chat um, by my incompetence. I'm not sure. So Matt, it's going to give me a prod to the, the chat function. Um, so we're going to look at the wood pigeon first. Again, it's 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 the humble wood pigeon, vastly overlooked by lots of people. Um, again, easily confused with its um, urban dwelling cousins. Uh, but one we look at is the wood pigeon. So the one you'll tend to find in the countryside. Um, obviously, it's a resident bird. Uh, it's also a winter visitor. Um, it's it's a native bird, cleave um, glacial evidence uh, of its existence, um, and it's in no uh, desperate need. Uh, it's conservation state, so it's green, you can see there, it's conservation green in Europe, in uh, Europe and the world as well, so we've got no fear of them running out, and actual fact, you can see the bald point there, the population has increased by 137% since the 70s, so it, it is a hugely increasing uh, population and species, and again it tastes bloody good, uh, but it also does quite a lot of damage, which is why we control them in the first instance. Um, and, and the last little point there, it's not game, and, and neither is rabbit for that point. Um, strictly speaking, if you look at the Game Act 1981, there are only strict species listed, and that's black game, um, black grouse, uh, hares, uh, pheasants and partridge. So it's not strictly, in the eyes of the law, game species, but it's just so widely now accepted because of the food that it's a game species. But strictly speaking, it's not. Uh, you are not doing anything wrong by calling it game, so don't, I'm not going to try and tell you to take game off your menu because you're saying wood pigeons, you certainly are not. Uh, so why manage wood pigeons? Uh, like I've said to you, um, the population is booming. We've got about 10 million uh, wood pigeons at the start of the breeding season here, so and that's not including all its offspring. Um, so they'll have a clutch of eggs, obviously, and rear young. So at minimum, we've got about 10 million of these individuals in the UK, uh, which I don't know if any of you come from an agricultural background, they can cause phenomenal damage. Like staggering amounts of damage uh, to agricultural crops, see your crops predominantly, but also greens when they're coming through, so your vegetable crops when they're very first sprouting through, again, it can go and do quite considerable damage. Um, and, and the kind of contextualization of that is that third point down. So if we took that 10 million individuals on one day, they will have to consume 500 tonnes of food, uh, and that's every day of the year at a 10 million population. So the volume of grain of which they are um, consuming is just massive and there's no farmers that can absorb those types of, um, of those losses nationally. So it's why they're controlled. Um, and it's because of that reason alone that we manage pigeons. They cannot be shot for food. And I want to get out there right now. That is a, a big misconception. Uh, they are only to be controlled in accordance with the general license, which is a bit of legislation which controls how species are taken. You can absolutely eat them as a byproduct, as a food product of that management, but they cannot be, so it's not a one for the pot mentality as it used to be, going out with a shotgun, popping a pigeon and having it for lunch. And equally, if there's one sat on your bird table and you're in a kind of semi-rural rural area, you can't pop it off your bird table because you fancy pigeon for, for, for supper, okay? That is not a good enough reason and you'd actually be breaking the law. So slightly geeky, slightly bit of boring stuff, but it, it just, just contextualizes that you can't just go and get these things as and when you want them. There's quite strict uh, rules and uh, procedures to get through to get them. And nine times out of 10, it's a gamekeeper or it's a shooter that's doing that on your behalf. Uh, you're buying them from a dealer or maybe direct from them. And they've done all that kind of legwork. You don't have to worry about that. It's, there's no season as such. So you haven't got to worry about getting them out of season. Oops. Uh, and that will show you there. So I know there's lots in there, it's quite a busy slide, but I thought I'd just pop it there um, so you can see it anyway. Um, and there are all the, the feathered game seasons with the addition of wood pigeon at the bottom. So like I said, no closed season. Uh, and just, just while I've got your attention, you can have a look at that and I'll try and get this PowerPoint to you. 
um, or that table is on the Basque website as well. And that will just show you all the different seasons for the birds, so seasonality when they're absolutely in season. If you're getting game outside that, then it's clearly frozen. Um, so again, you kind of your peak stuff. And over the big main dates, so like the August the 12th, the grouse race, as it's often, uh, if any of you are fortunate to get hold of some grouse, uh, the first ones of on the 12th are helicoptered down from, from where I'm, up in, up in the north of England or in Scotland. And they tend to be helicoptered down to the kind of your best restaurants in the country because they want them that evening. And it's, it's called the grouse race. Um, so yeah, seasonality of it all, but it doesn't affect the wood pigeon. Um, so how are they controlled? Um, well, quite simply, the shot, um, they aren't controlled in any other way. Um, that's, that is the only method of control, the only effective method of control. You've got to have tried non-lethals initially to scare them off. So it's a, a shoe before you shoot was a, a bit of a, a bad slogan uh, that, was, that was kicked around. But ultimately, you do have to try and get them off your fields to non-lethal purposes. And 99 times out of 100, that is completely ineffective because of their numbers and, and the cost and the time involved. So they are controlled by shooting. And that's different times of year. Um, so roof shooting tends to be the start around now, um, kind of January to March. Um, you'll find that a lot of game shooting estates will stop shooting the 1st of Feb and then they'll move in and probably have a month quite heavy and hitting the wood pigeon in the roof shooting, which means you're finding when they come into roost. So you're finding where they're sleeping, essentially, and you're waiting concealed in the woodlands and you get them. You actually intercept them on the way there. Any other time uh, they're on spring drillings, um, the, the early germinating crops, or in the latter part, they're in the summer harvest. So again, that will help, hopefully, depending on when you're getting these ingredients, it might tell you what's been paired with. Um, so be, this time of year now, there's very little grains out there, uh, whereas your birds in your summer months will be feeding on grains. That might affect the seasonality and the ingredients you use on your recipes um, if you can try and use seasonal ingredients. Um, a bit of an elephant in the room, and. You might, you might or might not be aware, um, for, for generations, um, shotguns, uh, which are used to control pigeons, have, been, have used lead shot. So lots of little pellets. It's not a singular bullet that goes out and kills these things. We're not that good. Uh, we need lots of little pellets. And they have all been, for generations, lead. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to start schooling on, on the issues of lead. We all know it. Uh, but 12 months ago, we've just gone past the kind of 12-month birthday, if you like, um, all the shooting organisations collectively came together and we're doing a voluntary transition away from lead, um, which is already happening. Lots of people have already started using steel for pigeons anyway because of the food demand and, and the demands and the concerns of the sector. So lots of it is already happening, if I'm honest. Um, I've been um, lead-free, let's say, for nearly two years now, and that was just a, because I realised that was the way it had to go. Um, so there, there could still be pigeons being shot with lead. There probably is. I'm not going to sit here and say there isn't. So that's just something of your due diligence to check that your ingredients when you're getting them. If it's something you're concerned about, uh, ask the question: Where were they shot? When were they shot? What were they shot with? And you're within your rights to ask that question. And and a lot of the pressures coming from onto the shooting sector is driven by the food sector. Is is quite an understandable. Um, um, desire to not eat lead shot. Um, the chances are it's not in there. Um, the shot tends to pass right through them anyway, but there has been lead passed through it. So they're now being shot with steel, uh, is, is the new kind of shot, and there's lots of other allies that are being used. Being used. But certainly within the, within the next four years, we expect an almost complete transition away from it. It's not law uh, that might come in, in 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 that time, but the moment it's a voluntary transition. So I just wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to address the elephant in the room and, and, and this is just a, a very personal, um, slightly uh, facetious slash sarcastic uh, one for me. Food labelling, please, if you're going to serve pigeon, tell them it's wood pigeon. Uh, the amount of people I see, oh, pigeon, they're horrible. They feed off bread and bits of stuff that people chuck at them in the street. There are a, a huge number of people who do not know the difference. They just think pigeons are just one UK species. Um, and that was that, and that's just the thing I encountered lots of country for live when we saw it was, it was wood pigeon. It's quite commonly slanged as pigeon for the most that shoot them. Um, people do automatically think of that feral one that's, that's feet are full of poo and resting on the eaves of some multi-story car park. Um, so just make it very clear that it is a wild wood pigeon. Um, and, and obviously wood pigeons aren't farmed. Um, 
So it's a, it's a truly wild bird. They've had no human intervention, no human interaction other than the point of its demise. And gamete hygiene, transportation, again, the wood pigeons, as all the small game, needs to be inspected and cooled by the person shooting them and to a temperature of one to four degrees. Um, and that's quite important. Um, if anybody wants to comment, although I'm struggling to see comments, uh, Alex, if you can, I don't know, you might be able to see. Oh, I might have got it there. Apologies, I'm just trying to fight and grapple with my technology. Uh, see if any questions coming in. Uh, yeah, if anybody knows the reason why it has to be chilled to one to four degrees, uh, I'd be most impressed. Um, so if you want to pop a comment in there now while well, I wrap it through this other bit. Um, so yeah, they have to be kept between one and four degrees as soon as reasonably practical after its point of demise. And that needs to be in a chiller or larder facility. So I'll be in large scale, it would be a proper walking uh, larder or chiller. And small scale, it could be a converted uh, drinks cabinet. Um, so it would be um, like a, like a, um, a walk-in shop fridge, for example, uh, sorry, an open door fridge. Lots of people use that and that can safely hold 50, 60 pigeons in very easily. But what you need to make sure is there's, lot, there's lots of air around them. And you can see in the picture there, they're, they're all in bread crates because that helps the air circulate. You have a single layer of pigeons and under that you have another single layer. So it's got nice, good constant airflow around. Um, I think yes, just sorry, can, I, can I quickly interrupt? Um, Gavin's got an answer for you. He says, would it be um, to control bacteria growth? It is, yeah, absolutely, yeah, 100%. That, that's very, very well done. Uh, yeah, it is. So it's to try and limit bacterial growth uh, within there. And it's because that the pigeon will have the viscera in, in the first instance. So the viscera in, in all the internals. When most birds, if not all of them, are shot and put in a chiller initially, they will have, they will be completely intact. They've not been touched or knifed or cut open in the first part. Um, it's only during processing that they'll then have all the viscera removed. So because all the guts are in there, that's when you chill them to a cooler temperature than say a D or a large game, which is one to seven degrees. Um, and that just helps us control and slow back to your growth. So yeah, 100% uh, in, in your response there. Uh, and the last bit is a small game qualification is required to supply game for onward consumption. So they should have a, a wild game meat hygiene certificate of qualification. So you should not just be accepted and bob down the road um, to then put in and serve to people. Now you can have your own personal consumption. You can give them to friends uh, without any qualifications or uh, courses. But as soon as it goes into uh, public consumption uh, or there's any kind of even um, gifting kind kind of stuff, that um, you then have to have this qualification. Um, right, I don't think I've got any questions, so I'll just keep cracking on. Okay, I've got it. If Thank I'm you. missing anyone's questions, again, just come off mute and just shout at me and say, oh, you're ignorant swine. Um, uh, yeah, so I've got some of there. How do you get the qualification? <clears throat> so lots of people, uh, we've got our own internal ones, so Elantra one or uh, the National Gamekeepers Organisation or Basque run their own wild game hygiene courses. And that is taking them from the point of death until it goes to a dealer. You then obviously need your food hygiene qualifications to um, in, in production and manufacture for your next two ones, your catering ones thereafter. But so for me, um, it's a one day, one day course and it's all about small games. So it covers all of them. And um, the large game side of things, which we're not coming today, that tends to come as part of the deer stalking uh, qualifications. Um, so you would get your large game qualification, but this one is a standalone. So it's a one day Lantra course. Um, it, it, it's a relatively simple, straightforward one. Uh, and I can provide people details of that after this in the chat, hopefully, if we, if we manage to do that. So if no one else got any further questions about uh, the wood pigeon, I can move on to the rabbit. The question about how long, how long does it take to get the qualification? Did you... It's a one day qualification. One. Just one yeah, day. one day, yes. Yeah, and it's 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 large it's largely um, a PowerPoint presentation, a talk, and then there's an exam at the end of it. But see, it covers all, all small game. Uh, I don't know what the cost is off the top of my head. It's sub one hundred pounds, to my knowledge, um, Gavin. I think that's yeah, I think you're from Gavin. Yes, sub one hundred pounds. So again, that would only apply if you are sourcing the game yourself, and it's all about inspection to make sure they've not they've showed no signs of abnormalities or disease and know the, uh, the cooling temperatures and the handling procedures of the game. That's, that's essentially what's centered around. Right, um, 
I'll move on for just for time. Um, so this one is uh, the European yeah. rabbit. Again, the humble rabbit, uh, which again, you will have all known and seen at some point in your lives, I would, I would hasten to add. And we've got a really fun um, next speaker called Chris, who's going to work through and hopefully have some ferrets to show you. Um, but I get the boring bit of going through a power plant with you. So bear with me and you've got a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, I promise. Um, so European rabbit is obviously non-native to our shores initially. Um, it was introduced by the Romans uh, as pets primarily and they've escaped. And we know then definitely the Normans put them out for fur and meat. So that's why they come to be on these shores. Uh, obviously widely distributed everywhere. Um, and you might well remember from your youth, I don't know how old you are as a demographic, but certainly use uh, the rabbit population would be massive at one point in time. But since the 50s, has been quite dramatic reduction because of uh, myxomatosis and um, a viral hemorrhagic disease as well, which has drastically reduced rabbit numbers. Um, I'm fortunate slash unfortunate where I'm up in the north of England, uh, up in kind of Cumbria, North Yorkshire border, that we've got uh, no shortage of rabbits in the slightest, um, multi, multi thousands of them. Um, so yeah, no issues, but I'm, I'm very aware, I used to live in, uh, not far from Winchester, it was a, a lovely sight to see rabbits. It was a quite a rare sight as well. So uh, I do know, I, I know the issues. Um, again, just like I mentioned before, uh, not list on the game uh, act, but widely accepted as game. Uh, why manage rabbits? Uh, they cause phenomenal damage. Again, and it's no, it's no um, different to the wood pigeon, really. We don't just shoot them for, for the hell of it. The, the, the part of a course management plan and, and often a statewide management plan or a farm management plan is that they need to be controlled and they will do huge damage to header. So the pitch you're looking at, it might come up a bit pixelated, I don't know, uh, is not far from me. It's where I do a bit of my shooting and it's a pals estate. Um, didn't own it. I'm not, I'm not trying to name drop your works there. Um, and, and he controls the rabbits and it's about four and a half thousand rabbits a year on his particular beat, his area. It's about 10,000 rabbits on the whole estate. So vast, vast numbers of rabbits being taken off. And that particular bit of ground, everything on the right hand side of the image, you, you may or may not see, is actually overgrazed by rabbits. Um, so it, they, they cost huge overgrazing on, on heather and grasses as well. Um, so they're, they're an agricultural pest as well, of eating uh, cereal crops, vegetable crops and uh, for planting trees as well, so they're a bit of a forest, it's a nightmare. Um, low densities, they will eat trees at high densities, they will do um, kind of mass grazing of areas. Uh, and then the bit that, again, Chris will probably touch on as well, is that they're a, they're a health and safety pest as well, they can undermine the subsoil structure of horse paddocks, if any of you've got horses, it can be a bit of a nightmare. The holes themselves, uh, horses can get the hooves in and twist the legs, or that to all the ground could give way as well. And that's especially true on uh, railway lines, etc. So they're a bit of a health and safety issue as well. Again, I'm not gonna bore you all that because you can, you can easily get off the Basque website, but you can see again, the rabbit at the very bottom has no closed season. So you can manage them kind of as and when you want really. Uh, there isn't the same condition as the pigeon. So you don't necessarily have to have a reason for doing it as such. Uh, you can you can go one for the pot style if you wanted to, um, whereas a pigeon, like I said to you, is covered by a general license. Uh, and how they're controlled, um, multiple ways, um, more, more ways than the pigeon, obviously. My background is, is shooting and trapping. Uh, I, used to, I used to work on a state as a gamekeeper, so I had a, between two and 4,000 rabbits a year was my annual call. Um, again, so quite significant numbers, and they were all done uh, by rifle shooting, shotgun shooting, or drop boxes, which are a, a live trap. And there, are, there is another way, ferreting, uh, which Chris will come on to in greater detail and probably much more enthralling um, session next. That, just out of interest, is, is a drop box, um, if anybody didn't know what it is, and it's used by gamekeepers, foresters, and it's essentially a little uh, sprung-loaded trap door. So you would um, put the trap on the side of a fence that runs through and the, the little critter runs through and it drops through into a box, hence the drop box. And they have to be checked um, once a day, ideally twice a day, removed live. And you can either um, release it into the big wide world if you were that way inclined, or if they are being a particular pest, then you would obviously dispatch it. But the beauty of that for you guys and girls is that they're completely unmarked. They're completely fresh carcass. A ferret hasn't bitten it, a bit of shot hasn't hit it, a rifle, round hasn't um, dismembered it. So in regards to having a full clean carcass, 
that's the best way of getting them. So um, again, it might be when you're sourcing rabbit, you ask how they've been sourced. Um, again, there's no contamination risk with them at all. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very nice way of doing it. And again, it's, it's you're doing someone a favour. North of England especially has lots of them just because of the volume of rabbits. Um, oops. In regards to um, the rifle round, again, the vast, vast majority are shot with rifles, not many shot with shotguns. So again, they'll be shot in the head for, for a clean and humane kill. So you've got no risk of lead in there really. Uh, there will always be lead in the head, but in the body, uh, there's no real risk of contamination at all. So um, you, you haven't got that bit to worry about. Uh, and just like we said before, same as pigeons, they have to be stored between one and four degrees, just the same. But the slight difference is that they tend to be uh, panched, gralicked, and there's all kinds of word. Panched would be a very regional term, essentially disemboweling um, and eviscerating the carcass. They tend to be eviscerated rabbits before before chilling, um, even though uh, even sorry even because of that, they're still chilled to one to four degrees. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at some things here, some questions. Yeah. The guy who, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's lots of people did. Lots of people grew up uh, around an air rifle, uh, plink and the odd rabbit for the pot initially, and then the, and they've progressed. Um, age of the rabbit before being handled. Uh, again, it, you can be quite select. Obviously, with shooting, you would um, you would take up what you need to within my two to four thousand. It would just be any rabbit because of the, the levels of habitat destruction that they were doing. Um, so, but I mean, regards to you guys, you want adult rabbits really, or certainly three quarter grown rabbits um, because they're the best eating. You've got to get the most meat off them. A little tiny scuttler, as I would call a little tiny one, is a nice ornament to you uh, um, from a cooking perspective. So yeah, it's got three quarters grown. They're born all year round, obviously rabbits. There's no set breeding time, um, but it's a common misconception. They don't breed all year round as such. They can breed at any point in time um, for gestation and reproductive cycles. But they do have a high breeding output, which is which is one of the main issues of them. Um, just a, again, a point: fur game must not be kept in close proximity to feathered game or large game. So if you, if you are taking fur game into your establishment, you need to make sure there's physical separation between your feather, your small game fur, i.e. your rabbits, and your large game fur, as in your deer. It can't all be piled on top of each other or touching. You want it to be completely separate. So ideally some physical partition, whether that's a clear screen or a curtain or something, um, or, or just a good distance. And that's just to stop cross-contamination. Um, and I think that is about me, chaps and chapettes, I think. Uh, I know it's not the most riveting, um, Chris will be far more interested in these ferrets, but this is the backstory of um, where these ingredients come from and why they're managed. So a little bit more about um, the ingredients themselves. If anybody wants to know more about I'll be getting to shooting themselves and um, getting in contact with me. Um, I can provide my details. Um, absolutely, yeah, it'd be a pleasure to do, uh, to get in, involved in shooting. Uh, any questions, I can open up, open that up to the floor. Um, I'm happy to, if anybody wants to ask any questions away about the two subjects or wider stuff, um, I'm happy to be put on the spot for four minutes. I've got another four minutes left. That's a gallery view. Should we go back to gallery view, uh, Alex? Um, okay. I'm just trying. Is okay. Is Alex still with us or has she disappeared? I know, I'm here. Oh, okay. There we go. I've removed the spotlight. So if we go to gallery, is, um, has anybody got any questions before we move on to you could unmute and um, Okay, so, well, it's, it's bang on half past, so thank you very much, Curtis, for that. It's fascinating. Um, we'll be able to grab the slides, I take it. Um, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, I can, I can send slides on and equally uh, my personal details when he wants to get in contact. Absolutely no problem at all. I'll be sending out the, the presentation to everyone afterwards as well, so everyone have that for their records. Okay, great stuff. So uh, I think now we're going to move on to, to Chris Potter and uh, the ferrets. Well, I'm going to share a, a short film first before we do. Okay. You can have a thumping good time out ferreting.
Look at he there with his shirt and tie on, look. <laughs> we are on a 100-yard stretch of hedge on a Somerset farm. Chris Potter runs Somerset Rabbit Control and he's out doing the work today. Uh, today we're obviously rabbiting. Um, basically, I'm rabbiting for a big wheat farm. Um, basically, they've got problems with rabbits and uh, consequently I get phoned up to try and sort them out each year. For the last two or three years, this hedge hasn't been cut at all. It was very thick and the farmers had this actual hedge cut just basically because it needed doing. There, there was a lot of problems there with rabbits and he just wanted the rabbits caught. So make it make the job a lot easier. He's cut the hedge and sort of give, give me a ring and say come along like you know. They will they will cause a lot of damage. I mean as you can see out in the fields there you can actually see from the hedge how much damage they've actually caused. Let's have a spade. Basically what's happened is I've gone to dig in there where the, where the actual rabbit was and by actually doing that, I disturbed the rabbit. So the rabbit then in turn, turned around with a ferret and it come out on its own, which is really lucky, really. <laughs> so you ain't got my hand on it. <laughs> it wouldn't be ferreting without a bit of spade work, but in this berry, the ferrets are not laying up to munch their way through a nest of kits. Chris may have brought in the heavy brigade with his human help today, but he's working a light team of ferrets. Uh, today I've actually got four gills with me today. Um, basically, the, the, the berries aren't very big, so consequently we're going through with like two gills at a time. Um, basically, what's happening is I'll use probably two gills for two or three hours, and then what I'll do is I'll change over and use another two or three, another two gills. So when is the best time to go ferreting? I mean, everyone works differently. I mean, me, I started sort of September time, and I'll go through sort of till the end of February one because obviously it's warmer the climate. The rabbits seem to be breeding a lot more. So sometimes what's happening now is like, well, like the other weekend we went out. Unfortunately, there's still a few baby ones around, but you just got to muck on and, and get on with it. Because otherwise, like I say, we're not going to get much of a season otherwise. Now we can't go through today without mentioning it. Chris works for the family butcher in Wellington, Somerset, and he has good reasons to feel proud right now. <laughs> yeah, he won, a, he won an award the other day for pork turkey and cranberry sausage. So, uh, Is that a national award by any chance? It was actually, yeah. I was, I was very, very lucky. We, um, we went into a competition at Sedgemore Market last year, which we actually was lucky enough to win. And then it brought us forward to go in the Champion of Champions, which is in Smithfield in London. And we were lucky enough to actually win, win it overall against 18 different sausages that have won across the country. You can buy those sausages at timpotterbutchers.co.uk. And if you want to find out more about Chris and his ferreting gang, look for Somerset Rabbit Control on Facebook. And if you want to find out more about ferreting, have a look at our ferreting playlist. So hi there, my name is Chris Potter from Wellington. Are we, are we all on? Can everyone hear us okay? We can hear you. Perfect. Afternoon, everyone. We can hear you. We, we've, we've got Chris here with us today down at the larder in, in one of our fields. And Chris is one of our regular ferrets during the season and harvests a lot of lot of our rabbits for us with, with his ferrets, of which he's brought three three gills along with us today. Chris, would you like to tell us a little bit about your, your gills and your ferrets that you've got with us? Firstly, what is a gill? So a gill is a female ferret. Um, a hob is a male ferret. Uh, I use my gills basically for small hedgerow berries, uh, small sets, and I use my hobs basically on the bigger ground berries and bigger hedges where the, there's more holes that the rabbits are actually in. Yeah, so what Chris is telling us here is most of the rabbits he catches with the ferrets come out of hedgerows. So down in Devon, Somerset, where Chris works, we've got a lot of deep um, soiled hedgerows rather than just, just brash and stickiness. So the rabbits live in the base of these hedgerows and it gives the ability to use the case of nets and ferrets to catch the rabbits to then quickly dispatch them and harvest them for us to then receive to process them further. So Chris, how did the nets work and with right. the, and, the, and the ferrets together? Okie dokie. So basically how it works is, is I'll go ferreting, I'll put the ferrets obviously down inside of the burrows and they go into the sets. And I use, what I use, I use a purse net to put over the holes if I can't net all the holes, then I use 
a long net, which is this piece of equipment here, which basically, if a rabbit comes out of a hedge and tries to run across the field, basically the net, the rabbit will run into the net and the net will just tangle up, tangle up the rabbit and then obviously it's yeah, safe to, to dispatch. Um, I can show you exactly how a purse net works. I'll just put it back in a second. And then you escape. Right. Okay, so this is a purse net. Um, what I've made myself. Uh, basically, the peg goes in the ground above the actual ring. And basically, this net would be over a hole wide open like that and basically what will happen is subject to the ferrets actually moving the rabbit because sometimes they don't move the rabbit but uh, subject to the ferret actually moving the rabbit the rabbit will then come out of the burrow and it will go into the net and it doesn't matter what color the actual net is as the rabbit's eyes don't adjust to the actual brightness of the net basically what happens is because they're sort of partly color blind the rabbits run straight into the nets and what happens is as that peg is in the ground the net just closes up like that so your rabbit is inside of that net and its head and it's obviously its head is right through one of these meshes and his feet and his claws are all caught up inside the net fantastic so using that net there you then capture the rabbit and our wild devon rabbits or somerset rabbits from you guys um from a point of view just touching on what curtis mossop was saying about um, the practicalities and sensible ways of looking after what then is now our food product of a rabbit. I'm yeah. assuming you quickly dispatch them and then what, what do you have to do from that point onwards? Right, so what I'd usually do, I normally quickly dispatch a rabbit. Um, the next thing I'd actually do is I would hang, I'd actually stretch a rabbit out, I'd hang it up. And the reason I do this for is because if you leave it in a bunch on the ground, then basically by the time you know bigger boat sets in, it will just it'd be hard to stretch and it will just look like a lump. Whereas if you stretch it out and make it look nice, you end up with a much better product. And what I'd also do is obviously because I've already stretched out, I would then paunch the rabbit in the field. What, what's paunching, Chris? Uh, so basically, that. so basic paunching would be take that type of rabbit, and then basically what I would do is I would refrigerate it. I spread it out and refrigerate it so that we got you know maximum coldness going straight into that product perfect and i must say all your rabbits that you send us are fantastic always and um, rabbit comes back to us in the fur so we either collect them from chris or chris delivers them to us so they're in the fur they've still got their heads and legs on and we take them into our larder and we've got a first initial room for all all our fur products so when they're still in the fur and in that room there we can inspect the product it gets chilled down into a chiller that's under five degrees and then from that point forward, we can take them out um, with orders coming in, skin these rabbits down and backpack them down to send out, hopefully, like some of the samples you guys received this week. So, no, fantastic, Chris. I think that's that's told us a good one. Do you ever get any problems with the ferrets um, getting stuck down the burrows or anything like that? Um, yeah, we do. So, I'll show you. Um, like I say, so, so basically, when I go out, so basically, when I go out, I obviously take the ferrets out they always wear a collar now what i will say to everybody is anybody who goes ferreting this is really 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 essential um especially this time of year when you know the does are a bit harder to sort of like make them out of the burries um basically what it is is a collar and it tells you exactly whereabouts your ferret is under the ground so this binder will tell you basically if the rabbit well sorry the rabbit and the ferret is sort of three or four foot under the ground or whether or not it's sort of six foot down underneath the ground, but it will work from a range up to 16 feet. So you can basically put over your one side of the hedge or the other, you can normally detect where the actual ferret is at all times, which in my view is the most key thing. Cause the last thing you really want to do is go out and lose one of your best ferrets or even worse, if it's a pet that you really, really love, then you're, you know, that's one thing you don't want to do. So if it's a pet you really, really love, you'd name it, wouldn't you? <laughs> so yeah, what, we what, would your, do. what are your ferrets called, yeah. Chris? Uh Well, <laughs> to tell you the truth, I haven't got very many names for my ferrets. Um, <laughs> I do a lot of showing as well. And I suppose really a lot of my show ferrets I keep, I mean, I don't actually work. Um, to be honest, I've got 40 ferrets. You can't work every ferret. So, I mean, I've got a team of about a dozen ferrets, actually, which I will work. Um, 
like I say, my show ferrets and that, I've got names like Bruno and <laughs> Sharky. Yeah, so it, cool. it's, it's, it's got different sort of names for them, which people can relate to when I'm at shows and they call out results and things. But um, yeah. my actual work animals, I don't actually, I don't actually show. But you've day job, you were a butcher, aren't you? Yes, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm a butcher, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so this it all relates quite well. You know, you're managing the land, you're getting the rabbits in, you're selling them. Do you sell many in the shop? Yeah, I mean, if we've got rabbits, I mean, we'll sell 15 or 20 quite happily a week in the shop easily without a shadow of a doubt. And the good thing about it is, I will say, is that quite a few people now are actually buying them and actually eating them. Whereas about, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, I suppose people were, were buying them and it was just so late, oh, I'm going to bite it for my dog, I'm going to bite it for my cat. But it's just nice that people realise now that, you know, that rabbit can actually be a good meal. Well, it's, you know? it's great, isn't it? It's low in fat, it's high in protein. Exactly. And it's yeah. quite, actually quite delicious. So we're going to be doing some yeah. cooking with it later on today yeah. so in terms of what you actually feed the ferrets what do you feed yeah. them um so my ferrets i mean you can you can give them a range of things really i mean what i will turn around and say to you is it is that uh, i feed mine a lot of raw food um whether it being chicken whether it being rabbit um beef mints pheasants again they're, they're a good option but i mean i do feed a little bit of kibble i must admit which is normally a doc, dr john kibble but what I tend to do, I mean, I don't actually give them all kibble. I like to put meat into my animals as well, because in my view, if you put meat into them, you get the best out of them. And that's, to me, that is the most important thing, really. So is it just animal instinct that makes them go for rabbits? Is it their natural instinct? Is it in their blood or how do you train them to actually um, go for so, the rabbit? So with a ferret, basically, it's all done by scent. So a ferret will go underneath the ground and its vision under the ground obviously isn't great. So it's all done by scent, so they'll come along to the rabbit and then, and then you hope really that the rabbit will come out because obviously if the rabbit doesn't come out, I mean a ferret will actually have a go at a rabbit. You know, a ferret will, you know, it would kill a rabbit under the ground if it had a chance. But, um, but that's the type of thing that I'd like to try and avoid because at the end of the day, you know, it's better that the rabbit comes out, gets dispatched quickly and you catch it in a net. And one of the, one of the key ways of doing that really, in my view, is less noise. I mean, the more noisier you are, the more problems you're going to get. Like I say, I mean, I see a lot of people in you know, the past go out and they, they shout and follow to each other over the other side of the hedge and automatically the rabbits know you're there. Whereas if the rabbits don't know you're there, then you're quiet. Nine times out of ten, they'll, they'll come out more, more quickly, more frequently. So you were talking about minimal damage. That's what the chefs want. You know, they yes, want they want yeah. rabbit with minimal damage so that it looks good on the plate. You know, so, yeah, and also when it's not stressed too much. The, and yeah, yeah, the eating yeah. is affected as well, isn't it? Yes, when it, yes, when it's stressed definitely. Too much, you know. Yeah, so. Definitely, yeah. But no, I, I think that I think that's absolutely brilliant. You know, it's great for the guys, especially guys that are in cities, which a lot of the lecturers are. And we've got guys on from the Dorchester today in London. We've got guys on from Inner City Bath as well. We've got the Mint Room chefs watching. So thank you, Chris. Thanks for telling us all about how you do. And uh, yeah, no, you well, we're glad to have you. So thank you very much, and thanks for introducing the ferrets to us. Right, we're going to go back into the larder now and see Curtis, and uh, carry on with our uh, presentation. Thank you, Chris. Hello, Alex. Have you transferred us back across? to me. Oh. Where is everyone? I'm here, Curtis. Don't know where Fantastic. I'm. Can everyone hear me? See you now. You're on spotlight. <laughs> as long as we've got a thumbs up, I'm happy. Right here, I've quickly run back across the fields and come into the larder, and we're in our initial processing room of where we have got a ferreted um, Devon rabbit carcass from uh, Friday. So it was harvested last Friday. It's been kept in the fur. Okay, so they've been kept in the fur for today for us to then give you a little demonstration on skinning this carcass down so we can have a look at what's been delivered to you guys at home to cook up with and, and process. So am I correct in saying, Neil, you're doing the dish with the rabbit or is it Matt? No, it's me, Curtis, yeah, I'm doing... Fantastic. So I'm correct in saying, Neil, that you're looking to use the loins of our rabbit today in your dish? That's right, yeah. Righty ho, so I'll bring the camera down now. And you can see see our rabbit here, which is on a poly chopping table. Um, 
The first thing to note is that Chris has very cleanly um, eviscerated the rabbit. So we're looking at removing the stomach and lower intestine and the green, the green offal, as it were. So this means that the carcass hasn't got any, any gluing whilst it's been kept and it was chilled down by Chris in the field and brought back to us. So this is how it stays until it gets to this stage. The first thing we need to look to do is to remove the extremities, its legs, head, and then, and it, uh, you know, in the end, it, it's coat. So there's, there's different ways of um, doing this. We use a set of secateurs because it's less, less aggressive. Some, some people can use a meat cleaver. As I say, there's, there's different methods to, to skin a cat, as it were. So just a quick snip through the bones on the rear legs and the front legs just to make sure they're broken before you go in there with a knife. And then also, if you grab the rabbit by its ears and put the secateurs in behind its head, you go through that vertebrae there as well. So from once you've done that, you should then be able to pick up your knife, take a nice small incision behind here and remove the head. That goes straight into our bucket on the floor and do the same with our four legs. So we can take them off and put them in. By doing it that way, you get very minimal damage to anything inside because you've not hacking through the bones and you don't get fluff and fur everywhere as well. The way I skin a rabbit is I pinch the back of its skin here and rabbits have always got a nice bit of fur on their back and take the knife and just do a thin, thin cut in through its back and up through. That means I can then use my fingers to get into the back of its little pouch here and pull in both directions. So it's quite a physical task to pull a rabbit's um, skin off. It's not, not a simple, just a easy pull. You've got to have a bit of physicality to it. And you can pull both ends off and it comes off in two, two chunks. So you've now got a nice clean rabbit, still got the tail attached, and you occasionally get some fluff around the front end where the neck's been taken off that you could simply just pick off like that. All we've got to do now is lay the rabbit on its back you can instantly then see where Chris has paunched the rabbit, as in removed, eviscerated it and removed that gorilla. And from that point, this is the first time we can obviously sex the rabbit. So this rabbit was a male, it was a buck rabbit. And we can get our knife and remove that product. And also I like to remove the edges of where the paunch is in case there was any contamination in the field because that could have happened by accident. So if we take that away, then there's no risk of contamination there. And we can continue back between the rear legs, flip the rabbit back over onto its front, and we can just slice underneath the tail, which removes all elements that end and keeps the rabbit nice and clean. Okay. You can also see here now that Chris has left the offal in for us. So we've got our two kidneys, a slight buildup of fat around our kidneys, and then we've got liver, diaphragm, and into the heart and lungs. All of that, depending on our customers, some customers like to receive them within our rabbits, some don't. So it's something we always discuss with the customer and go from there. But in this case, we'll remove them and put them also into our bucket to move on. Before I go any further, I'll just wash my hands after touching the fur and start again with the meat. So Neil, this is how the rabbit turned up to you, am I correct in saying? Neil? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's, that's it, that packed just like that. And then, um, yeah, what oh, I would suggest is that, that um, okay. Yeah, obviously we're gonna keep the legs and um, the carcass and use them for other things that we can confi them or, you know, braise them for other dishes, but with, uh, sort of 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, I thought we'd do a little dish with the, the loin fillets. Perfect. So if you're looking to break the carcass down into what we call its primals, so it's two rear haunches and rear legs, and then the front end with its shoulders, and then you have the same as what you call with the venison carcass, you have the saddle here in the middle. So this is where Neil's gonna get his two loins from the eye of his loins running either side of the spine, they're a muscle that doesn't work a huge amount, so they're a nice tender muscle and fantastic for, for cooking with and enjoying. Simple way of doing this, again, without making life complicated or using any complicated tools, is using the secateurs to just cut through there, and you can do the same 
on the front end, just behind where you can see the shoulder blades are and take that off. And then it is as simple as just running your knife through and breaking the back of the rabbit there. And you can cut through those loin, the rear of the haunch. So you've got a nice haunch of rabbit there, the two rear legs, nice and clean, and the back end of the rabbit with, as you can see, there is a decent amount of meat on there. I know, I think Curtis Moss have got a question earlier about the aging of a rabbit um, and that side of things. With ferreting, obviously, you've got slight lack of ability to tell their age until they're in your purse net or your long net, so you can't, you can't see what's going on until they're there, and then you can make that decision, possibly whether you dispatch the animal or put it back out to let it go back and grow a bit all. Um, from a way, another way that Curtis was doing stuff with the drop boxes, Obviously, if you find your rabbit in a drop box and you find it's a, a small, um, young rabbit, you can again release that and let it continue and you can harvest a select one. So you've got an ability there to choose which rabbit you harvest. The way I tell when they get back to our larder is how easily they skin. If the rabbit's really tough to pull that skin off, it means it's probably quite an older rabbit and it, it's not as young and supple to skin. Um, and if it, if it pulls off fairly easy like this rabbit, um, it's slightly younger, but it's, it's still got a very good covering. Another way of telling is the length of their teeth in their mouth. So if we ever find we've got any long toothed rabbits coming into the larder from our ferreters or shooters, um, they probably end up in our game pie mix rather than going out as saddles or haunches of rabbit. So we bury that. Slightly digressed. So we've removed the rear haunches and now we can remove the saddle. So again, cut down through where I went through with those secateurs earlier. Might have just missed a few ribs here, so I might just go again. There we go. And then you can just take off behind the shoulder blades there, and you're left with your three elements to your rabbit. You've got a nice saddle, the same as I'm sure all your chefs have seen with a venison carcass or other carcasses, your haunches, and then your shoulders. I'm sure there's plenty of other things you guys can all come up with to use these products, but I must say our shoulders normally end up in our game pie mix when we break a rabbit down. Our haunches can go out, we, we sell either on the bone or can go as diced rabbit because it's an easy, easy product to dice, even though boning out a haunch of rabbit is a little bit fiddly. And then our saddles tend to, when we break a carcass down, go out as a whole saddle, we clean them up and back pack them down as a whole saddle, just like that. As you can see, it's, it's not a bad sized product, um, from that from that rabbit, we got 200, that's 290 grams. Okay, so there's there's a bit of product there to use. I'll probably pass you back to Neil to take this rabbit further now from taking the loins off and go from there, I should think. Is Neil there? I'm here, yes. So so basically, Curtis, I've done mine already, but uh, yeah, I just took um, took the two loins. I'll show you in the fridge. Shall I show that bit now, taking the loins off? In fact, um, it's, it's great timing because um, basically I've just left mine in a little marinade of olive oil with some garlic and some thyme. And I've just left them to, to um, marinade for, to pick up that sort of lovely garlicky thyme sort of flavour. So I've got the two, the two loin fillets like so. Fantastic. Okay. Alex, do you want me to break down the pigeon now for Matt and go from there, or are we going to see Neil cook it, the rabbit dish and then come back to it? No, I'm last. I think what we're going to do is um, we're going to give people, um, if, you, if maybe if you want to do the, the wood pigeon, then we'll give people 10 minutes to, um, to have a cup of tea and refresh. And then what we'll do when we come back is if everybody's going to join in, they can prepare their the rabbit and the, the wood pigeon. And then at three o'clock, we should be ready to spend the last hour to do the, the two dishes uh, with Matt and myself. Perfect. Not a problem at all. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, so Great, yeah. we just want the two loin fillets like so. Yeah, that? sorry, Curtis. Same for my dish as well. Just the two pigeon breasts. Um, I've done what Neil's done as well and taken the breasts off. So if you can just show them, show them that, and everyone gets to that point. No problem at all, Matt. I shall do. We'll finish the rabbit off then, everyone, and then we'll move on to 
our wood pigeon. So back back on the block here, we've got we've still got our rabbit saddle then. So just like you were loining out any other carcass of meat, run your run your knife down the back of the vertebrae, and you can start see and um, whilst using your fingers because it's such a small small item here, you've got to be a little bit more delicate. You can see the meat. You can push the meat away from this vertebrae here, and we can run this right down through and take that loin straight off. Very simply, it's not, not a big expanse of product to have to deal with. And then you do get a little bit of what I call flank attached from the rib meat that we can then also just remove. And you can do that just by pulling, kneading it off with your thumbs and hands. And then you're left with a lovely straight loin there um, to see. And you've got a nice, nice loin from one side, which is a good amount of product I'm sure to cook with. And then if we do the same again, down the other side of this rabbit carcass we've got here. And there you go, look, you can see the, see the bit of flank still attached. So again, if we just knead this off with our fingers, you've got a nice layer off and it just pulls off nicely. That can go obviously into, a, I'm assuming, a sauce or any other product. And then we've got our two loins here ready to cook. So from, from, from a mature rabbit, taking those loins off there, we've managed to harvest 124 grams of high quality wild loin from that rabbit. So that's the rabbit done, everyone. As you can see, all you've got left is a bit of vertebrae and ribs left from that rabbit. We'll now move on to our wood pigeon. Um, so because we've, we've, so we've got a question from Lisa. She says, how long can you keep the, um, the rabbit in their fur in the fridge? Um, it varies. Uh, we, we try and keep ours for a maximum of 10 days, in, in all honesty. Um, and the only element we have that we struggle with with that is obviously the people that harvest our rabbits for us might also take them back to their chillers and put, put them um, in their chillers for a few days and before they deliver them to us. So there's, there's an element of guesswork there and not everyone is honest enough to tell you when the rabbit was harvested, which can be a little bit of a problem sometimes. So it's, it's a bit of judgment from my part and in inspecting, inspecting the product and seeing how it comes in, seeing that they've been paunched and cleaned out nicely and you can get an eye. But nine times out of 10, we'll process rabbits every Monday and whatever we've got from the week before, we'll get skinned and backpacked down on a Monday. So it, it, we try and keep it the least possible. Right, hey, well done, chef. No worries at all. Move, moving, moving on to the wood pigeon. These little wood pigeons we've got here were harvested from one of our pheasant shoots. Curtis touched on it um, when he was doing his presentation earlier. Our gamekeepers are now all free. They haven't got any pheasants to be looking up in quite the same way and not demanding so much of their time. So they get out and do a bit of population management of the corvids and our humble wood pigeon. Um, fantastic product. We take them in in the feather. Unfortunately, I can't show you a plucking session or anything about these because it's a separate building we don't do any feathers in this building at all it's purely just fur from the small game or the larger venison so there's, there's no feathers here so we've actually got a wood pigeon in the same format we sent them out to all of you guys to en enjoy so i'm going to show you how the best way or the way we um fill it and breast out our wood pigeons which people can take them out and crown them or they can or they can just breast them out and do it this way. Quite simple again, and it's very similar to following the vertebrae um, of the rabbit with loining it out. You just got to follow that center line down and make sure you get as much product as possible off that crown of wood pigeon. So again, it's a quite a small, delicate little item. So you, you've got to be steady with your knife work and make sure you're removing all elements of that breast as you go. Another debate that we have with a lot of chefs is skin on or skin off on our pigeon fillet. So there's a pigeon fillet there with the skin on, as you can see the nice pink 
pink side with the smaller fillet under the breast are still attached on the on the top side but as you can see so that is currently skin on we find a lot of chefs like skin off or certainly a lot of our wholesale butchery clients like skin off because they feel it looks better um, from a cooking point of view i'm no expert you guys are the expert at that side of things so it we we work with all our clients and produce whichever's best it it's as simple again as kneading it off with your fingers and pulling that skin back to remove it from from the breast and you get a nice clean finish that way there's no knife marks or work within the breast it just pulls pulls off nicely unless they've been nipped like this one has with a bit of shot and there's a little bit remaining there at the top that i'm not going to fuss about right this second so there you can see that has been cleaned off now and we've got a clean breast from one side we can do exactly the same on this side of the crown and remove move the breast just like so then you've got pigeon carcass and again the skin stays on initially and we can easily remove it just by pulling it off with our fingers and going from there so i don't know which way matt's cooked cooked these pigeon breasts today whether he's cooked them skin on or skin off I'd be interested to see but there we go we've got two two of our pigeon fillets um back from one of our wood pigeons um plenty plenty of meat on there to enjoy So in terms of uh, butchery, Curtis, when did you first start getting on the tools and, and learning the art and craft of butchery? I was very, very lucky that both grandfather, who's now in his 80s, and dad were heavily involved with deer management. And a byproduct of the deer management was obviously our venison carcasses. Um, they used to send a lot of the venison carcasses down the route of the game dealer and send them on that way. I took on the business, well, there was no business at that point. I took on the deer management when, when as soon as I could walk and talk kind of thing, I was out with dad and granddad. And then I, as soon as I started driving, I was, at, you know, as soon as school finished and the light daylight was there, I was out stalking as much as I could. 2017 came along, I finished university where I studied to be a charter surveyor in rural land management. Um, gave me a lot of interest into the valuation side of property and the impact surveys of deer, deer is, you know, the venison's effect on the environment and all aspects of that, just like the rabbit and the wood pigeon. Um, pigeons have a massive effect on arable crops and farmers' costings on how, how, how much they yield from their crops. And likewise, the rabbit also munches its way through a lot of product on the hedgerows, whether it's a, a dairy farmer's silage field that he needs to feed his cows, or an arable farmer's wheat crop that's growing around the margins of this field. They, they take a big impact. So all of these different elements, we started getting requests to come and manage and population management is where the business started. And as I say, we got left with a lot of byproducts that we felt right to do something with. Um, and instead of just sending it to the game dealer, I wanted to take that further and process all of our products in, in a way that we could sell them direct to the consumer and receive feedback because what I do from a management point of view in the field, the, the feedback at the end of it, if someone enjoys it at home, the plate in a restaurant, wherever it is, it doesn't really matter. As long as it's enjoyed and that, that animal has been harvested to help a farmer out and help a farmer's business out, but it's also given a secondary benefit to someone at home to enjoy them and gives that animal a bit of respect and moving forward. So. I learned as I went as well. We did a, I did a few different butchery courses. We did a, I did a week course when I was 16 in all, all butchery with, with all sorts of animals and also did a week's work experience in a butchery shop as well down in Devon, just to learn a few bits. But I've, as I say, been lucky with grandfather and dad, both having known how to do this and self-taught, I suppose, is the honest answer. So now you're teaching others. Um, you're doing the CPD today, and um, we've almost sort of formalised it in a way that you're actually setting up a game butchery academy here at Lada. Yeah. When we're allowed. Yeah. When when, <laughs> when hopefully the, the light is at the end of the tunnel now, so this this will be able to begin. But yeah, no, we've got very exciting times. Of got a lot of people asking from a venison point of view, 
wanting to come down and see see the process further. They're either keen keen stalkers and keen keen in the outdoors and what you know enjoy seeing the deer, but they want to want to learn a little bit more, which is that that's educating people on how that animal that they see walking around. A lot of our areas are fairly populated with people, so we got a, we also have a lot of um, respect to educate people with what happens to their product. So yeah, no, getting people up to, to see this side of things and what we do is something I'd love to share. So you've got a new website, haven't you? If the uh, lecturers and the chefs want to check out your website, what's our URL? Uh, we are curtispitsdeerservices.com, so fairly easy to remember. Um, so from that point of view, you can go on and view, view all the products we sell. And we're just coming to the end of our, our feathered game in the form of the pheasants and the partridges, both breasts and whole birds, because we've just been harvesting a few post lockdown and COVID restrictions recently on an individual basis. But otherwise, everything is still available and will be till the end of April when the season ends for venison. And if they want to hone their skills that they've learned today, you've got a bit of a bone in knife. Uh, that you've had done. Yes, you? yes, we have. We Flint, Flint and Flame have kindly produced us one of our bowling knives, and and we've got them all branded up, and people seem to be enjoying them. So you can yeah, get those on the website as well. And, and are you going to do a special offer for people if they want to buy game after today's session on the Yes, site? I'm sure we'll, we'll put together something, and I'll ask Alex to kindly send it out in the email, and you guys are more than welcome to get a discount on some of all our products that we do at the moment. And for the chefs watching, you know, I mean, some chefs have already had samples, like the guys at the Dorchester, the guys yes. at the Mint Room. We've got them all on today. Hiya, sorry for hiya. We've got uh, Shravanan. We've also got uh, Soham as well from the Dorchester. Um, it's great to have the interest of both um, the college lecturers and chefs. Definitely. And we can arrange for the chefs and lecturers to come and visit, potentially with students as well in the future. And you know, teach them all about the land and the way it's managed by Curtis, a bit of butchery and uh, conservation a lot, really. Because I think it's really important yes. when we talk about provenance that we know where everything comes from and how it's respected and managed and prepared, ready for the kitchen. So I think that brings us to a close of our first half. Neil, do you want to let everyone know what's happening next? Yeah, could you share the spotlight so that uh, Curtis and myself are on the screen? Great. So Curtis, you're you're going to be around this afternoon, aren't you, to stay with I us? I am indeed. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. I've just got my this. this, this I've got the the um, the loin fillets in the in the fridge. Um, but I was going to ask you. You mentioned obviously this this is the leftover. So I've got the the carcass here. Um, we've got the the legs and the the shoulders, etc., and the haunch. But you've also got these um these belly flaps. These belly bits here that come off the side. Do, what do you do with them? Do you, uh, um, the, exactly those bits that I kneaded off with my hand. So you've got a little pile here of both both sections that have come off each loin. In all honesty, we mince them down and feed them to our working dogs. So we we're we're very much a case of trying to be as zero waste as possible. So all different elements are used and we actually use them to we mince them through actually our mince that's in the background here we freeze down a big batch mince it all down and then it, it supplements our, our working dog's food so that's that's quite a piece of uh, you know there's two of those obviously one either side isn't there so it's yeah quite substantial when you look at the 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 quantity of product that you get from one rabbit you've got the two you know completely tender almost fatless uh, loin fillets but then you've got um, the, the legs here that can be as i say confied or braised slowly uh, you could use the bones for rabbit stock if you particularly wanted to but i think it's just such good value to get so much versatile product from from a rabbit yeah just touching on that neil is actually it's a very good point rabbit is actually one of the best products from a boning out percentage that we process in the larder so our venison carcasses bone out at roughly 50 to 55 percent usable meat product um, i haven't actually ever worked out a percentage on the rabbit but it's most definitely better than that um, the, the pheasant is far worse and the, and the partridge is not great either but um or and neither is the wood pigeon sadly but because there's a lot more carcass to it but the rabbit has got such small delicate little bones as as you can see when you've broken it down yourself they do bone out really well 
there's a lovely bit of haunch meat that comes off them and even the shoulders when you carefully bone out those shoulders you can get a nice bit of product to to mince or put into a game pie mix for a casserole well somebody's just commented that they make gorgeous bunny burgers bunny burgers sounds lovely so, so has, has anybody got any questions before we have a quick break um curtis is going to be around for this afternoon and um I'm going to turn my volume up. I'm going to put some headphones on when I actually do the demonstration. So I'm a little bit of a distance from my computer at the moment because of the camera. Uh, but basically, um, if we if we go for a break for, for sort of 10 minutes, come back, um, then we'll have to do the butchery. Obviously, Curtis will be here if anybody wants to ask a question, um, jump in, or if anybody has a, you know, bumps into an issue or something like that then Curtis is here to, to help. Um, and also you've got the recipes. So if anybody wants to do any mise en place, um, chopping onions or frying the breadcrumbs or anything like that, just to get yourself a little bit of a head start, then um, please feel free to do that as well. So uh, I've got one now, Gavin is uh, doing his now. So he's on the mise en place already. So, uh, if we rejoin in 10 minutes, if that's okay with everyone, have a quick uh, refreshment, get yourselves organized, and we'll get the, the butchery done uh, by three o'clock. Then it's over to Matt for the wood pigeon dish, and then I'll finish off with the, the rabbit dish. Okay? Just give us a thumbs up if everyone's all right with that. Excellent. So I'll see you in 10 minutes. Thanks, everyone. So, so really, guys, the next half an hour is just to get um, your butchery done. Is everybody joining in? I can see a few kitchens in action and a few. Uh, Rebecca, are you not doing it? <laughs> no, I didn't get any product. Becky, where's your rabbit? I think I sent to me and um, having a kitchen at the moment. Ah, uh, all right then. Okay. Right, so if everybody wants to get their their rabbits prepped and their wood pigeon prepped, and then if you've got any time left, uh, you can basically do some some of the mise en place. You've all been sent the um, the PDFs of the the two recipes with all the all the bits and pieces there. Uh, I've got mine up on the other screen over there. Um, but really, for the next half an hour, it's uh, Matt, Curtis, and myself are available. Um, if anybody wants to ask any questions about any element of the the two dishes, um, if you want uh, a wine recommendation, then for mine, I'm going to go for a Chianti Classico. Okay, because it is Friday afternoon, so uh, you're, you're allowed to have a little tipple. I'm gonna, I'm gonna recommend a Chianti. So um, I don't know. I think Matt was gonna go for a. I can't remember. Was it a Merlot or a Malbec? Where is Matt? So if any, feel free to take your microphones off if anybody's got any questions or just wants to talk or anything else. It's, it's a little bit strange. Um, hey, welcome to the new world of teaching, eh, Neil? Yeah, 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 yeah. Dead, talking, talking to dead <laughs> silence and pictures. Yeah, it's a bit... It's Except like all the students have their cameras off. You never know quite <laughs> sure whether they're actually there or not. I, know, I did have one student went for a shower day. halfway through a class. Oh, Eleanor's got some Chianti as well. Good, good, good news. Yeah. I've got a Cabernet yeah. Sauvignon Blanc. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Eleanor is actually Kevin, by the way. <laughs> I was going to say, you didn't look much like an Eleanor. No, I'm, I'm an ugly <laughs> Eleanor. <laughs> with a beard. Yeah, with a beard. I did, 
you've got to be careful you this, Kev. these days, what you say, haven't you? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, Matt, what, what's your tip all this afternoon to go with your dish? I've got only small bottle Sauvignon Blanc, though, what we're cooking with. So I've gone white wine, actually, for uh, what we're going to use okay. in the dish. Okay. Right, is there anything, Matt, that you want to recommend that people sort of concentrate on? or? Um, so we're going to leave the skin on, skin on the breast, on the pigeon breast, so we can get on with that. And, um, and yeah, then we're good to go, really. Um, is there any elements of mise en place that might take a little while? I've got chopped shallots here, uh, sliced my mushrooms and got some chopped garlic. Um, but yeah, just in the recipe, really. But it's worth getting all that ready. I have a question, Chef uh, Neil. Uh, yes? That instead of uh, wine, is there anything else I can use? To drink? No, 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 for, that, for the ingredients, because you... Uh, <laughs> Yes, I got a coffee. <laughs> oh, I haven't. Uh, there's no wine in the um, in the ingredients. Have you not got the list? No, it's, it's in the wood okay. pigeon uh, line. Wood up, pigeon. I think. Wood oh, pigeon. Okay, so that's for Matt then. Sorry. Do you not? You, what? You can't use wine, or you just don't have any wine? No, I don't use wine uh, for the for my dishes. So I can use if I use the same same uh, um, recipe. I can use the wine, but normally I don't use the wine for uh, any of my dish. A uh, bit of stock, a bit of chicken stock would probably work in there. Yeah, All right. that down and then add the cream. That would make, make a nice okay. sauce as well, yeah. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you, Chef. Props. Uh, Neil. Yes. It's just looking at the, the, um, the offal that was left. How about a quick idea for that single heart as an amuse-bouche? Yeah, that's a good uh, good good point. Um, open to everybody, but uh, I think maybe with the Italian theme, I think I would maybe um, get a little bit of toasted bruschetta or something like that, some garlic. Um, really, just quickly fry it. Maybe slice down the middle, a little pepper on the top. Maybe use a little to... cognac to uh, to flambe through, just to get a little flavour through there. I use the livers to stuff the loins sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. And just stuff well, them, roll them with palm ham. Just to put a Welsh aspect yeah. on it, um, those flaps that you held up uh, before, Neil, uh, and the heart yes. and the offal, uh, we have a dish in Wales, uh, faggots, um, and uh, a, a rabbit faggot, all finely minced together, uh, sorted off with some shallots and fresh herbs and garlic, uh, and some, some of the offcuts, which are finely minced as well. And then you, you wrap it in the crepinette, pan fry it, and then braise it. Some of the stock from the bone is really nice. Yeah, it sounds That would be a nice yeah. little starter, too. Cool. Just Drink trying to think what I'm going to do with the rest of it. So lovely. Thank you, guys. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're good deviled as well. You could do all the deviled with uh, all the sort of rabbit offal as well. Yeah, I was thinking along those lines. But, um, there's, there's barely any waste. On, on the rabbit, I found that, you know, there's hardly anything, really, really minimal. What would be the massive difference between the dissection of the rabbit compared to a hare? Obviously the size difference, but I would have thought the- Big difference the, uh, in meat the, as well. Would it, would it work with the shears, you know, going through the backbone, just the same? Kurt, are yeah. you still with us? Hello, yes, I am. We can't hear because we're muted. Curtis, have a question about hair. Hair, uh, yes. Hi, Curtis. Um, obviously, uh, there's the size difference between uh, hair and rabbit. But if you if you are preparing uh, a wild hair uh, in the same kind of way, uh, the primals would be pretty much the same. But would the shears still work through the backbone and through the through the saddle the, the same way, or would you need something a bit stronger? You're right, it's definitely tougher. Um, we, we get we source all our hairs from up the line because unfortunately down in Devon the hair population is not as big, so we try not to you know diminish that at all. So we get we get our hairs up from Wiltshire and Hampshire in all honesty. And all our hairs, yes, I do process in exactly the same way. 
but we do have to occasionally use a meat cleaver to break through that backbone. You're, you're perfectly correct. Absolutely fine for the legs. No problem at all. The secretaries always work. The neck and the vertebrae on the neck to remove the head. That's where sometimes we need the meat cleaver. And then taking the front end off and the shoulders, secretaries will always work. And then meat cleaver might be needed to remove those rear haunches. But we always try with the secretaries first because it's more accurate. You can see where you're snipping rather than slamming a meat cleaver down on it. Thank you very much. No worries. So how, how's it been? How's it going, everyone? Yeah, when you are. So. So for the uh, for the onions for this crumb, I'm not chopping them ultra ultra small. I'm just going to cut them into sort of a fairly small dice, really. Like so. Not not a, a really fine dice. Perhaps um, is everyone uh, about ready to cook a pigeon or he's on plus checkup? Yeah. Well, mine's just done now. So any, any questions about the rabbit or the, the wood pigeon? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Yeah, I, I've got a question. Um, another question, sorry to dominate. Um, at college, obviously at level three, uh, we have to teach our, our students how to uh, skin uh, and, and also quality points of ears, teeth, etc. So. <laughs> We're looking to get in whole rabbit skin on uh, that are just gutted. Uh, do you supply those, or am I best looking for a local game keeper? Or... I just left the end of that. Oh, okay, sorry. So basically, Curtis, can you supply rabbits fur on or not? In all honesty, I have to check the legality of that one. It's not something we do, but I don't know from a processing and whether we can send that in. But if we can, yes, we'd be more than happy to. Um, Curtis Mottup or Matt gives me my first like a bit more now. Curtis, are you still here? Possibly not. But yeah, no, I'm more than happy to discuss that one. And please feel free to send us an email and we're happy to. Okay, thanks. Okay. It's for teaching purposes, so that students can, can practice, practice uh, skinning uh, as well. But yeah, no, no. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe, maybe once you've got all your stuff together, together uh, perhaps uh, you could put, put it into the chat, chat and just say that you're ready, ready, and then I'll keep an eye on it. I've got a bit of a... Uh, feedback, feedback, I don't know. Hi. Hi. Somebody got multiple speakers on. Okay, there's no rush, you said at three o'clock, so don't feel under pressure. But... Uh, Equally, I don't want people to feel like they're standing around with nothing to do.
Yeah, there's a lot of echo. I don't know if people have got more than one speaker on. Or, or mic. Hello, Bob. Have you just joined us, or have you been here all the time? No, I just saw other people have put their name, name, and where they worked on, so I did the same. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. Okay. Neil? <laughs> Neil, would you, would you suggest we blanch and refresh the pasta if we've got time? Yes, yes, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, any, anything that you want to do uh, in terms of mise en place, feel free. <clears throat> okay, I'm just keeping a check on the, uh, the mise en place. My sound better, or is it still faint? Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Okay. I've got little headphone things on now, so it should be better. Just okay, going to mute so my mic. I'll just pushing up. <laughs> There's a few people uh, ready to go, but uh, we've still got time. So if you're ready, just relax, have another cup of tea, or open your wine early if you want to. Uh, we're going to start with the pigeon, uh, the, the wood pigeon dish. Always remember to say wood before pigeon. Very important um, for your customers. So uh, Matt, Matt will be starting with that one. Then what we'll do is cook it uh, and then obviously don't put it to waste. We'll sit down, try it, see what you think bit of self-evaluation and then after that we'll get up and um, we'll do the the rabbit dish and then hopefully we'll have a little time at the end obviously to eat the rabbit dish and um, to just ask any questions or just uh, we'll have a general sort of conversation about thoughts and reflections uh, and anything for Curtis as well. 
Gavin, Gavin George, are you able to unmute yourself, please? <laughs> yeah. Can you, you? I know. I know that you bought a boning knife, didn't you? Because there was a fifth. There's fifty percent off from Flint and Flame, which yeah. everyone else is still able to uh, to use to to buy one. Can you can you tell us a bit about how you found using it? It's amazing. Um, it's very light. The it's good. It's very very firm. Um, short blade, good curve to it as well. Um, it's well balanced in the from the hilt. Um, overall, it's just excellent. The sharpness on it has been amazing. Um, and it's got a good edge, got a good good curve to the tip. Um, as you can see here, it it sort of it curves a little bit sharper at the tip of the blade, but overall, that is one amazing knife. Wow, what's the cost of that? Um, it was ninety five pounds. Uh, before the discount through the chess forum, so you get it for uh, forty-five pound. So I do, I do have the um, the discount code. So when I when I send you the update of all the um, the the video recording, everything from today, I'll put that on there again for you. So with the link to their website, so everyone's able to redeem fifty percent off for that burning knife from Flint and Flame, which yes. I think Gavin will thoroughly recommend, wouldn't you? <laughs> Most definitely. You can even have them engraved. So um, if you fancy having your name put on there or something else put on there, like uh, chef's knives, leave, leave alone or something like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, excellent knife. Really, really good. I'm going to be looking to buy it, purchasing a few more and add to my ever-growing collection. Um, even to go with my, my, my actual ethnic knives I had last year. Excellent. Thank you, Gavin. No problem. No, it's a really good value for money. I'm going to seriously think about getting one. And um, I know they're highly thought of, particularly for the game butchery. How's the weather with everyone? It's glorious where I am today. Beautiful. Really nice. Stunning. Let me see out the window. It's just blazing sun. Sunny Wales at the moment. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, very often we get to say we've got a sunny Wales. <laughs> no. Make the most of it. <laughs> the first time I've taken my cool off in a year. <laughs> I'm tempted to play from just you know, just for the sheer hell of it. <clears throat> okay, so is everybody going to be ready to go <coughs> at three or yep. just before? Is there anyone that needs a bit more time? Oh, I'm okay. I think we're ready to go, Chef. Okay. Get ready to go, start doing the pigeon. Yeah, it's just a uh, thumbs up. Anyone, anyone not got the thing on ready? gallery? If everybody can just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Yeah, sounds good. There's a few cameras. Just picking my spinach at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, just a few more minutes then. There's no. Uh, there's no rush. Who's still based in Birmingham then, Neil? 
Yeah, I'm. I'm still. Um, I still live in Birmingham, um, but I. Uh, I left UCB just before Christmas. Did you? So. So. Uh, I'm doing various bits and pieces. I'm. I'm. I'm working a lot with the the chefs forum. Uh, I'm also doing a course at Harvard University in culinary psychology. So I'm teaching with two other people on that program as well. So bit of a challenge what, but um what university do you see harvard usa harvard yeah mm, i'm doing a course called culinary psychology with a doctor and a lifestyle guru and uh a food psychologist well he's a psychologist that's really interested in food so it's sort of like the culinary psychological medical lifestyle sort of combination thrown together um, we've got 53 students on it, uh, and that runs through to the end of May. And then we've just been asked if we'd like to do another one wow. um, for the next semester. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's quite hard work, but I'm enjoying it that bit because it obviously there's a bit of pressure with it. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's good. It's good. I do have to say, I find that very interesting. When I was in when I was in college, almost twenty years ago, they were barely just touching on the ideas of psychology with food and such, mostly on like the psychology of color and the things that make people hungry, why McDonald's is the color it is, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, there's there's bits of that, yeah, and um, very cool. Coca Cola got in a bit lot of trouble when they changed their. Um, their can from red to white in support of polar bears and everyone thought the recipe had been changed and yeah, there's lots of lots of that colour and sound and you all, you all know sort of Heston's work and the sound of the sea and crackling crisps and all sorts of stuff to get people going but yeah that's yeah, good. Did you sing Harvard University? Is that in Boston? Yes, Boston, yeah. Oh wow. I've, I've Not, I don't go over there every Thursday. I have to do it like this. Yeah. <laughs> it's a shame. I did go last. I did go last February, so it's a year in the making. The program. I went over there for a few days to discuss the program, um, on behalf of UCB actually, and then um, I worked on it. And then when I left UCB, I asked them if I could take it with me because they were sort of a bit, shall we do it, shall we not? So I said, well, if if you don't, I'll I'll take it with me, and they. They allowed me to, so uh, I could like just it. see you sitting on the square at eight o'clock in the morning on a sunny spring morning with your macchiato playing chess with all the all anybody yeah. that passes by. It's something else out there, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Pasta's almost done. Right, so. I think we should be, it's 5-2, so we said we'd start at 3, but I think, we'd, I think everybody's there now, aren't they? Ready when you are, Everybody okay? Okay, so over to Matt then. Matt, do you want to... Yeah, thanks very much. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, Matt here uh, from Basque. I work with Kurt, the same company as Curtis, who we heard from, from first on the food side of things. Um, chef backgrounds, sort of really enjoyed cooking with game love the countryside where it all comes from and think it's quite an important meat that sometimes you don't see enough of. So we work with education. We do some stuff in colleges and schools. We do some stuff on shoots where we, we go to the shoot and sort of they can often have a lot of game and not know what to do with it. And it's a membership organization. So help the members provide them with recipes, etc., with what to do with game and how to best uh, utilize it. I love cooking with it. I think what we've got from Curtis today, uh, fantastic the pigeon that I received. Uh, important, as they've stressed, wood pigeon. There's also French uh, squab pigeon, which appears on a lot of sort of fine dining uh, restaurant menus, They're upwards of £10 sometimes. That's farmed French pigeon. The French, in their wisdom, like to just farm everything and keep it tender and young. But uh, we want to avoid that. And it, using wood pigeon, British wood pigeon, available year round, can be used. So different ingredients, depending on the season. And um, yeah, quite affordable. I mean, I think Curtis Pitt's knocking these out for sort of two, two pounds 50 for a whole bird. Due to the time, we're just going to use the breast today. 
Uh, but if you save up the carcasses, they'd make a fantastic sort of dark game soup. I like making in the winter, roasted a lot of them off and uh, a slow cooked soup. On the legs, I'd generally save slow cook and then uh, breadcrumb. It's a bit fiddly, but slow cook them, then breadcrumb them and make sort of nice dippers, you know, as a little sort of nibble, really canapé sort of nibble. But yeah, focusing on the breast today. I know you guys are there's some good chefs out there, some uh, college lecturers, etc. I know the dish is quite simple, but I thought we'd do something quick and enjoyable uh, to cook along with. So first thing is just to get uh, the palm ham on a sheet and straight into the oven, hopefully preheated oven, sort of 180 degrees. Um, yeah, I, I think you guys oh, have to just ask Alex to put the spotlight on your camera, please, for everyone. It is, in, it is on, it is spotlight. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. I yeah. I'm, oh, I'm on it, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lovely. So uh, hopefully uh, we're just going to make a simple bruschetta. Um, it's funny cooking at home, isn't it? You, I suppose you guys have experienced it loads being lecturers, but it is a bit weird. Uh, we're normally in front of a classroom of people. You always just fear no one's watching you, but at least you guys are, are cooking along with us. So just, I've got two bits of uh, sourdough, but just give them a nice rub with the garlic. Uh, one or two, I just got a, a smaller loaf of bread, so I'm going to do two. And portion wise, we're probably going a bit overkill for just one starter with two. I'd say one breast, one and a half breast would probably be ideal um, in a sort of restaurant situation or a home situation, but we've got both breasts, so we'll cook them up. And just a nice bit of olive oil on the, on the bread, and we'll get that going in a hot pan. Riddle pan would be ideal. I don't, I don't have one at home, so just using the, the frying pan, but we'll get that going. Yeah, I know we're coming to sort of some of your, well, virtually coming to some of your colleges. I recognise some of the names on here next week, etc. But we are, you know, we're available to, to do courses. Curtis has got a good presentation, sort of a, a, a more broad version of what uh, he did today, including venison and uh, all the other sort of game meats. This time of year is when I sort of start cooking rabbit, thinking more about rabbit. I think it goes quite nicely with the the spring ingredients of wild garlic, the asparagus, things like that. And then through the winter, I think venison versatile year round, but through the winter, we definitely focus on the pheasants and partridges. So I find, I find game seasonal. And although most people think of it as winter, I think rabbit, pigeon, things like that do work well, sort of barbecue, barbecue ingredients. And they're pretty versatile. Pigeon make fantastic burgers and sausages as well. If you want to take the, take the breast meat off, um, take the leg meat off, and then just sort of 30% pork mints and fatty pork mints just to, uh, they're, they're a bit too lean really to, to make burgers all on their own, but they make fantastic, uh, fantastic burgers as do, as do rabbits for the, for the uh, summer. As that sort of gets going, nice color on one side, just gonna add a knob of garlic, a uh, knob of butter and a bit of rosemary in there just to give it a bit of flavor. And yeah, there was some chat about skin on, skin off. I cook something like this. I like to keep the skin on, uh, protect, protect it as it's cooking, hopefully crisp it up a little bit. But I understand some people, maybe presentation wise, take the, uh, take the skin off. You can roast them whole, roast them on the crown. They work fantastically like that. But I think breast portion wise, they can make a good GP in a restaurant. They're easy to approach and quick to cook. Um, and yeah, easy, easy to eat as well. Sort of fed up of watching people chase get whole game birds sort of roasted and, and struggle to, to deal with them on the plate. So I think as a, as a consumer, if you are serving them in a restaurant or introducing people to game, it's always easy if, if, if you've done the work to take it off the bone. I know Neil's doing that with his dish. Um, so yeah, I do that the same with pheasants really. I'd always cook the legs slightly separately uh, from the uh, from the breast. If anyone's got any questions or anything, do shout them out, but hopefully we can just have fun, do a nice dish and enjoy this. Yeah, this is sort of the starter part. And then Neil's is a bit more of a main course to have have to finish um, later on. Pretty happy with that. I'm just gonna, a couple of minute and a half, couple of minutes on either side. But yeah, nice color, crispiness. I'm just gonna pop that on a plate and put that into my warming oven. Just keep that nice and warm. Gonna do as a little, um, I'll wipe that pan out and keep it warm. We, we don't want loads of washing up on a Friday afternoon and loads of pan. So we'll, we'll cook everything in the same pan. Uh, a bit of home deep frying. I see some of you are in college, so you might, um, you might have a fryer there or something, which would be ideal. 
I've just got a little pan of little pan of oil on there, edge oil on a medium heat. I'm on induction, so sort of halfway. And it's always a bit interesting when you drop it in. Hopefully it doesn't go crazy, but just set nice sage leaves, add a bit of crisp to the dish at the end. I'll get them, get them ready now. They're gonna go with our parma ham. So drop them in for a bit of a fizz for, for 10 seconds. If you haven't got your oil on yet, you can just get it on and, and do this sort of for the last minute, but I drain them off onto, onto a bit of kitchen paper. Yeah, perfect. And a little bit of sea salt on them, Malden salt on them. We'll leave them, leave them for later. And yeah, on to our pigeon. So easy, easy to cook, really. I'm gonna back onto the veg oil. I always cook it with uh, veg oil when you're frying something, something hot rather than olive oil. We want quite a neutral flavour. I've put some picked thyme leaves on it. It's always lovely. Um, lovely sort of herby, herby flavour with game. I think Neil's marinated his rabbit with something similar and hopefully the, some of the ingredients cross over as well so you didn't have to buy tons of ingredients. Nice bit of sea salt again on there and a little bit of pepper. And yeah, these won't take, take long to cook. Skin side down into the pan for a nice sizzle. That's, that's a hot, hot pan that's going into. So we'll do two minutes on the on the skin side, touch more oil. We all cooking along. I can't really see anyone in the in the camera, but everyone's sort of following and cooking along. Yeah, all good, good stuff. Yeah, if there's any questions or anything, I'm sure you're all pretty confident and just looking forward to in, enjoying it. But it's a cracking product. Um, yeah, available year round pigeon, which is, sets it apart really, and it's with more and more people worrying about where their meat's coming from, you know, should we be farming so much? Should we be doing so much? It's pretty guilt free. It's all, you know, it has to be as Curtis explained, part of crop protection. So, I mean, these, these things need to be shot for the, uh, for the vegans to be able to eat their sort of grains and things. So it's, it's really as guilt free, guilt free meat to enjoy. Same as, same as venison really. Um, and the lead issue. Yeah. They are working towards that. It would help us massively as cooks if people did un start understanding that steel shots going to be the way to go. I mean, lead's just another barrier that we don't, we don't really need um, to stop it becoming such a mainstream meat. And certainly everyone says, why isn't it in supermarkets? Why isn't it here? And there's some pretty compelling answers that they can't, they can't sell things that have been shot with lead. So hopefully the industry is waking up a little bit to that and it's going to go a bit more lead free uh, for these things. Getting a nice bit of color on there. I've put two minutes either side on, on uh, my recipe. Obviously, that's sort of a guideline. We want to cook pigeon medium rare, I would say. Medium rare with a good rest is uh, the best way. I'm sorry, I've put a timer on that parma ham as well for eight minutes, so we'll see how that is when it comes out. We just want a nice crispy parma ham just to add to the dish. So, yeah, happy on that side, on the skin side, getting a nice bit of colour on there. Just flip it over. Smelling fantastic as well. If you've got the thyme leaves on it, my kitchen smells lovely now. And I've kept I've kept the little mini fillets on. I'll just lift them lift them up a bit to cook, just to penetrate it a bit. But it will all get sliced. So another minute on that side. Hopefully, this is the kind of thing that would be appropriate for for college students as well to cook. You know, quick dish, not too many uh, fancy ingredients to to get stuck into. I can feel that it's coming along at this stage. I'm just going to add a couple of knobs of butter. And some of you probably get fancy and put some garlic rosemary in there. I'm happy with my thyme at the moment, but you could, you could put a few more flavorful ingredients in there. I want to keep the pigeon as it is. And I'm just basting that up as it, as it cooks, smelling and looking wonderful. Classic sort of quick cook restaurant dish as well, all in one pan. So kind of thing that you used to do. Just roll it around in that butter. I can feel that's coming along nicely. Okay. 
And I'm sure you guys all know about resting, but this is definitely going to benefit from a good few minutes resting as we make our, make our garlic mushroom sauce. Yeah, lovely product, lovely size to deal with. Um, mine's very much nearly there. So a couple of minutes either side and then just sort of rolling around in the hot butter. About four or five minutes total cooking time. We will have warm sauce going over as well, just to sort of save the day if anything is a bit under, but I think that's, that's pretty perfect. I'm going to drop that onto a, a tray myself to rest it in the hot butter. Which again, will keep that, keep that cooking, keep all the flavor in there. Everyone happy with that? We're getting to a, a good point. Yeah, pigeons feeling nice, smelling lovely, no doubt. And then, yeah, we're just going to make a simple sort of garlic mushroom sauce. I need a tiny bit more fat in the pan. Hopefully our shallot that we've all done our mise en place and dice, dice one banana shallot. A uh, pinch of salt in there just to help it all break down. So I guess it's sort of autumnal. I, I think we designed this, we weren't quite sure when this was going to be, but maybe as we, as Certainly looking outside today in the garden, I'm definitely thinking more spring ingredients, to be honest, uh, going forward rather than autumn. But I think this was devised a few weeks ago or when we had terrible sort of weather and you wanted something a bit more warming, but feels a bit like the barbecue could come on pretty soon with what we've got at the moment. That's looking good. Should not sort of sweat it down. Uh, one minced garlic into there. Minced clover garlic. Nice bit of pepper, salt and pepper to sort of build the, build the flavor rather than season it all right at the end. It can be a bit harsh that way. And in go our mushrooms. I, I wrote 50 grams per person in the, in the recipe, but a good handful of mushrooms just to bring all that together. And again, smelling lovely. So yeah, this is going to be the Friday starter. We'll sort of sit down, enjoy this while Neil finishes setting up and then we can have the main course with, uh, with Neil, which is ideal. I, I, I know that some of the college lecturers, it's just so varied, isn't it? It's, it's sort of passion, often pa passion from the lecturer that gets game into colleges. I know some, some do so much and like you were talking about taking skinned rabbits in, et cetera, and then others uh, either don't have the confidence or don't have the the know-how to get it in there sometimes so we are there to to help and we can go as, as deep into the subject with curtis uh curtis mossop etc i think that's really important so the students understand where it's come from why it's come from and it's not just shot or harvested for no reason and why it's such a special lean and healthy meat that's the other difference as well we've got to treat it with a bit of bit of respect because of the wild lifestyle it has it's it, it is lean to cook and You've got to have a bit of skill, hence the terrible, you know, people think it's dry or it's not this or it's not that. But if you cook it carefully and, and something like this with a bit of cream, bit of butter, it definitely helps. I'm happy with that. That's all coming together. My mushrooms are starting to cook down. Nice splash of, splash of white wine. Let that all boil down together. Pretty harsh alcohol smells to start with, but that'll all cook down. Just checking my parma ham, it's coming along nicely. It might just be worth checking that, guys. You don't want you can go bitter if it's um, dark and horrible, but mine's looking good. We'll put a spoonful of, um, a teaspoonful of Dijon mustard in there, help the sauce along. Just turn over my pigeon breasts as they rest as well, just to give them maximum. They're looking great, they're feeling good. Not sure why that's in there.
Yeah, once that wine, that white wine's been cooked off. Uh, I know the chap asked non-alcohol, but sherry would work well in this as well, really nicely. Uh, but he could, you could have just put chicken stock in just to, to build the um, build the flavour. But I've gone for white wine today, and then put sort of fifty mils of double cream in just to bring it all together, bring the sauce together. that a good sort of maximum boil now it wants to be a thick nice covering sauce for the dish Just give it a taste yeah lovely One more minute on that palm ham. We'll take that on the last minute. Final things while our sauce is just bubbled, just for a nice bit of greenery, a bit more vegetable in there, is the handful of spinach, thick spinach, baby leaf spinach I'm using. Just to wilt down in our sauce. And some flat leaf parsley as well, a pinch of flat leaf parsley. My parma ham's ready now. I'm just going to take that out just to chill it for, not chill it, but just let it cool down for a minute just to crisp up. Put it with my sage leaves. And yeah, just turn the, turn the spinach through the sauce. Is everyone up to about that point? Yeah, looking good. I can see Gavin, George, Taffy, you're, you're good. The sauce is looking nice, smelling nice. Any juice that's seeped out the pigeon, any sort of blood, nice juice, that's all nice into the sauce as well, just uh, riching it, sort of riching it up. Riching it. And um, yeah, I'm happy with that. I'm just gonna turn that off and let that sit for a minute. Happy the pigeons rested. My bruschetta's looking good. And I'm just gonna... Those knives are good, those flint and flame knives. I know for sure uh, for all your sort of game butchery. They're brilliant. I've got a bit of an old Victoria knot that I'm gonna use, but pigeon breast, we're happy with that. I'm just gonna slice on the angle for this dish, I think. Nice pink inside, sort of medium rare. Again, I think we could have got away with one and sliced it thinner, maybe one and a half, but nice to treat ourselves and it's fantastic Curtis Pitt sort of product that came down. And then just for plating, you know, however you're eating it, however you like, but I like a nice bed of the garlicky mushrooms around the plate a little bit with that. Someone likes the dish, Matt, behind you. Uh, well, at my end, yes, yeah, big Trev. He just doesn't do anything all day and then knows when something's ready. But sorry about him, <laughs> get rid of him. Um, and then, yeah, I like to season as well inside the pigeon a little bit, just with a few little pieces of um, salt. Nice pigeon on top, and then I've got my crispy parma ham just to help. Garnish it up, give it a bit of crisp on top. And some, the nice crispy sage leaves as well that came out. So that's just giving it a bit more color and a bit more texture at the end. Yeah, that's, that's mine anyway. That's what mine looks like. It's been quite a simple dish, but Fantastic product from Curtis, the pigeon. We've still got the um, still got the, the bones to make a nice soup with, nice stock with, and we've got the, the legs to do something else with. But pigeon breast with sort of creamy mushroom sauce and crispy parma ham, can't really go wrong with that. And I think we should sit down and enjoy that. Yeah, 
Yeah, it looks stunning, Gavin George. You happy with that? Pigeon cooked nicely and yeah, ideal. Everyone, is everyone about there? I'm just going to put the. Yeah, and it's smelling nice. No, no one's overcooked it. pigeon. Yeah, lovely. Look at that. I can see uh, soy yeah. food. Yeah, looks beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, well done, everyone. I know you're all talented chefs, so it's a bit, um, I don't want to teach you to suck eggs or anything, but hopefully you can appreciate that quickly. Very Thanks affordable as well with the ingredients. And let's sit down and enjoy that before Neil goes on to the main course, guys. Yeah? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, please enjoy. And then um, come back in 10 minutes or so, and we'll, we'll do the last dish. Well done, Matt. That's great. Thanks. Thank you, Chef. Thank you. Thanks for cooking along. Oh, my goodness, Chef. That was absolutely beautiful. That dish was stunning. Well, that's good. <laughs> First time my son, my son's tried some of it. First time he's ever tried um, pigeon as well, so he really enjoyed it. Excellent. Never cooked it at home. <laughs> so how's everyone uh, enjoying their, uh, their wood pigeon then? You all nearly there? Take, take your mics off if you like. Personally, I think the, more, the most important part my girlfriend, who is not a chef and has never had pigeon before, is absolutely loving it. So that's that's an amazing mark of a good good recipe. Yeah, and good product. My son's just had it for the first had pigeon for the first time and absolutely thought it was stunning. Yeah, and I love it. Wasn't what he thought he was going to. I've I never cooked it at home. It didn't work quite a few times, but never cooked it at home. Hmm. How long do you reckon we need before we start? Another five minutes? A few minutes? Should we go for half past? Is that all right? That's another four minutes. Give us a thumbs up if that's all right. Ready when you are, Chef. Okie doke. I'm thinking a nice cigar is going to be in order after this lovely meal today. Oh, oh. I got the mic. <laughs> oh, we'll have a nice healthy, healthy lifestyle. The good thing being about uh, being at home is you can lick the plate and nobody can see you. Yeah. That, that was uh, something that uh, we were talking about yesterday at um, that course that I'm doing. But um, actually eating with your hands and doing things like licking the plate afterwards is a, is a real symbol of um, how much you're enjoying the food. So lick it, licking the plate is a, is a real compliment. If it's that good that you pick the plate up and you can lick it, then um, that says that the food's being pretty tasty. Okay, so we'll start the next one at half past then, which is in two minutes.
Well, I've got to do this, haven't I? them to put it over to you. Now the only bad thing about this setup, there's no students to start doing my dishes for me. <laughs> no, true enough. That's why I'm muted my mic, she didn't hear me doing the dishes. <laughs> I haven't washed dishes for ages. My kids were happy to tuck into the pigeon, but they're not too interested in doing the dishes. Yeah, he's gone back upstairs now. Even the dog's interested, but he's not going to do the dishes either. So we've had a we've had a two year old customer, and, and she loved it. So. Great to get them in young right now, isn't it? Get them started on this food, see what they think of it. Right, so. Well, my kids, because they've uh, grown up with a chef as a dad, will eat almost anything, which is more than be said for some students. Some of the students aren't that, that adventurous when you offer up new ingredients to them. No, definitely not. My, yeah, I think I my daughter's on the verge. She's just about eating meat, but she's uh, she, she loves, she wants to work as a, a veterinary assistant or a veterinary nurse type thing. Um, so she's finding eating animals um, quite quite hard. She's just about hanging in there. She's got a horse that she looks after as well. Um, but I can't see her being a, being a meat eater. My, my daughter reached that point. The cure for that's a bacon butty. You make yeah, bacon yeah. butties on a Sunday morning and don't make one for her. <laughs> no, she, ironically, yeah, you're exactly right. On a Sunday, she has a bacon and sausage butty before she goes to work, so... Really bacon is one of those things, isn't it? Right. So it's half past now. Should we should we get on with a rabbit dish? Yeah. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Is everyone ready to go? Thumbs up. Cool. Okay. So Alex, you okay? We're all good to go. You're on the spotlight. Okay. Spotlights on me. So you've also got the camera too, Alex. So could I just pop it onto camera two, please? Okay, remove, that's it, brilliant. So basically I've got all my mise en place here for, for the dish. Um, as I said earlier, uh, here's the rabbits, which have, uh, the, the little loins, which have been sitting in a little bit of olive oil, um, some fresh thyme, a bit of garlic, just to, just to pick up those lovely aromas. Um, I've done a different pasta today. I've put um, fettuccine in the uh, in the recipe, but I'm actually going for a uh, con conchiglie. Okay, so this is a little shelled pasta which I've, I've blanched off. Um, I've got some chicken stock. I've got the stock that I made from the parmesan and water. So basically, I'm just going to pop these into a pan, get these going. So the parmesan stock can can go into the pan so i switch the lights on there it might be better okay so that's going in just gonna let that reduce a little bit and then the chicken stock can go in and after that um the onions for the for the crumb basically I'm just going to go into some oil, which is not too hot. And we're just going to fry those off nice and slowly until they get a nice, crisp, lightly golden brown colour. So I've actually done some already. 
Um, if we just come back over here. So I've actually done some already. So this is just some fried breadcrumbs with sage. So I fried the breadcrumbs off, um, fried the onions off, and then I've just mixed them together with some fresh sage going through at the end. So you've just got this little crumb here, like so. Okay. So the onions are, are on their way. So I'm just going to let them fry down. Add more oil in there. So up here, the rest of it, um, got a pan ready for the uh, rabbit loin. I've got some salted water ready to rechauffe the <clears throat> pasta. I've got a pan to finish it all off in, and I'm just going to put uh, fry my sliced mushrooms in that pan there. So back over to the mise en place. Um, so I've just got some chestnut mushrooms which are sliced not too thin, you know, so they've got not, they retain a nice sort of shape, um, and that they'll they'll cook up quite nicely. Um, I've got everything I need, a little bit of butter cubed up, uh, ready to thicken the sauce and also a piece that I'm going to put in with some herbs just to, um, just to base the, the rabbit loins. Uh, the rabbit loin, as we said, is so, so lean and such a delicate piece of meat that it barely needs any cooking. So fairly hot pan, um, a little bit of butter to baste it, but really sort of four to five minutes and that will be ready. Okay, so if I let you crack on and get those bits going, I'm just going to start by, um, I'm going to get these mushrooms um, going. So I'm just going to place them down so they, so that I'm going to get a nice little color on them. Just make sure they all get a bit of surface so they color nicely. So I'm just going to get this my, my pan starting to warm. So I've got some um, rapeseed oil in there actually at the moment. So that's just going to um, heat through. I've got some tongs ready just to turn it over. Um, got some spoons, etc., over there just to um, for tasting and seasoning. Um, sorry, I made a, I've made an error. I should have. I had the flour. I was supposed to put the bread uh, the onions in the flour and then sieve it off before putting them in the um into fry so apologies for that schoolboy error so please Going to flip these mushrooms over. Yeah, so I'm supposed to just give those uh, breadcrumbs a little panne before frying them. So apologies for that. Get these in there. Thank you. 
there, just going to get the saw to reduce it a bit quicker. That's really just got a little colour on that. Okay, so they can come off. So in with the chicken stock. So this is just some homemade chicken stock that can go in there. We'll get that reducing a little bit quicker now. So that's the parmesan stock and the chicken stock now. So that we're just going to bring that up to the boil and let that reduce down. Very simple sauce. So can, could I have the camera back on camera one, please, Alex? So, so what I've got left now, while well, the, the stock's reducing, the mushrooms are pretty much there. Just got some parmesan ready to go. Um, I've got my crumbs that I actually fried uh, with flour on them first. And the, the, the fried breadcrumb and sage ready to go. Um, and then it's really just my butter and the, the thyme and my conchiglie. Okay. How's everyone getting on so far? Does anybody, if you want to take your mutes off, if anybody wants to. Looking good so far, Chef. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Good, looking good so far. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. What about the food? <laughs> oh, the pot washers arrived. Thank you. News. <laughs> Cheers. It's Friday. CPD. Lovely water. Exactly. So I hope you did your breadcrumbs before as part of your mise en place. Uh, you're, you're definitely, on definitely, chef. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Done because it's hot you. And and the stock was done. Excellent. I'm just going to uh, strain those, and I might do them again. I think I'll be fine if I just did them again. So I'll just uh, strain the oil off them, let them cool down, and then I'll breadcrumb them and fry them. Rabbit. Waste them. It's a rabbit. But I think it was all of it. I'm doing my own pot washing, by the way. I've got no pot washer. What did you try? Oh, in Cuba. You could, if you've got any of Matt's wine left, um, a bit of white wine in the sauce would go well as well, if you wanted to add a little bit of another sort of element to that, another dimension. I'm keeping the rest of that for drinking. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Should have said, you should have said earlier. Stupid idea, that. Ignore that last suggestion. I'm all gone. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to get my pan heated up for my rabbit loins. I'm actually going to place those mushrooms down there. Ready to go. 
Yeah, well, can we use the pan we cooked the mushrooms in for the rabbit loins? Uh, you can do. I'm not. You can if you just take the mushrooms out. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Absolutely fine. Yeah. Just You're using too many pans for me. Yeah, that's fine. It's just um, <laughs> the other ones. Just too. It's too small for the rabbit loins. They're sinking over the side. So. Yeah. Right. So. I can see this pan is starting to heat up quite nicely. So we're just coming up to quarter two. So if you want to swap cameras, Alex, please. Back onto this one now. Okay. Right, so my pan's nice and nice and hot. Uh, this pan isn't it hasn't got a great non-stick to be honest um i'm gonna give the, the loins a little season something oh. okay you can see that the uh the stock and the parmesan stock are going down quite nicely um so now i'm gonna just in the pan. Colour on those. Oh, can you mute? You're noisy. Right. And then put a bit of buffer in there. And mute it for time. I'll keep it safe as well. May as well go in. It gives a nice little seal all over. Light flavour. And if it's baked, these off. A bit more heat. And that's the rabbit done. So I'm just going to take these over, let them relax. So they can relax for a few minutes. And then it's a case of just finishing off the Sauce. So that's reduced nicely. Pasta's ready to go. Stuff's there. Nice warm plate in the oven. So that can come out for service. Right, so pasta in, rechauffe. I haven't got a spaghetti basket, so I'm just going to use um, 
because I'm just going to use a strainer. Um, I don't need to keep the pasta water because it's going to be used sort of straight away. Um, the stock's gone down nicely now. Just give that a little taste. Uh, adjust the seasoning slightly. So you've already got that sort of saltiness from the parmesan. Um, so just be careful there. And also there's a bit of pepper on those mushrooms. So that's all ready to go. Pasta's rechauffeing. Can I reheat the pasta in the uh, sauce once you want your verdict? Yeah, definitely, if you want to, yeah. So, pasta's ready, sauce is ready, crumbs ready. So, pasta in with the mushrooms. A bit of olive oil. I'm going to put some parmesan in there. The pasta. Stir around. All in together so you've got a nice olivey pasta, a little bit more pepper. I think this dish needs a bit of pepper for it. And then I'm just going to finish this sauce. So just going to monte au beurre. Bring that together. Let that finish off. Low calorie dish, this one. You have to go for a run afterwards. Okay, now just put a little bit of sauce in with the pasta. Go around. Ready to go. Absorb some of that stock. And over here with the, the nice little fillets. And what I'm going to do is just slice these. They look lovely, beautifully cooked. Slice it however you want, really, but. Uh, Okay, so now we're going to plate up. So I'll bring my plate over here. Okay, so these little seashells, whatever pasta you like, really. I think maybe a shorter pasta might suit it a little more. And then just carefully uh, 
I'll grab it over the top and then some of the crumb. And then we'll just finish with a little more of the grated Parmesan. A bit more crumb. Just maybe a touch more of the sauce. So this is just a little conglier pasta, mushrooms, and sauce. Okay, everyone. Can't hear anyone of our frozen. So we do all like pictures on social media, everybody, of your finished dishes. That would be amazing. Tag, tag us in, tag the chefs for them, and then we'll share them all. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> really good, Neil. Well done. Lovely dish. Curtis has said he's cooking it this evening here at the uh, larder. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah, it's quite simple, but I just think the flavours work. The, the parmesan, the the sage, the mushrooms, it's quite sort of Italian sort of theme to it, obviously with the pasta as well. Um, well, I hope people enjoy it. So do you want to come back onto the on main screen? screen. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of you for participating. Um, obviously, we'd love to do this in, in person. We were just talking, um, you know, about all the scope of actually bringing you guys down to the larder or maybe even having Curtis out in the field on a, or in the park on a stalk with Jess and so they could actually control the camera from there so you could see what goes on on a stalk. Better still, it'd be great if you can come and visit the larder once restrictions are lifted. Um, like we say, we will be doing a discount code to send out with the evaluation evaluation we'd really appreciate if you could actually send out the send back the evaluation let us know what you loved about this let us know what what you'd like to see next time if there's any other species of game you'd like to know about or cook with um, and we just really really enjoyed the session and hope you did too it's been amazing everybody having a <laughs> thank you okay. thank you very much thank you yeah, so much love to see yeah. you guys Yes, thank you. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chef. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're, welcome, you're welcome to stay on and ask um, questions if you like. Have you got any questions for Curtis or questions for Neil? I just want to come down. <laughs> <laughs> that makes two of us. I really just want to get, get get down there and see it all and be part of it and take part in it. Um, I just got to say, Curtis, watching you butcher something down, you do it with such care. It's almost like, as if you've got that sort of um, uh, sort of eternal. Yeah, yeah. It's like as if you like <laughs> that animal. You know, you you yeah. like that animal something like you know. And it, it's that say. care that you have, that that looking after it through the whole process and taking it apart. Yeah, especially with the venison side of things. Yeah, you know, we we see them, we see them in the field. We we manage them first and foremost as a herd for population density and herd health, and being able to bring that product back to the larder, process it and butcher it myself, and then deliver it myself to our local chefs down in Devon, and then even getting it sent up to you guys and hearing your reports on it further uh, afield is fantastic. It's absolutely amazing. And um, I'm definitely going to, try, going to get you on as a supplier for our college. And um, we'll be ordering from you very, very soon. Fantastic. Thank as you. As long as we get back to some sort of normality with the students, you know. But, yeah, exactly. uh, 
Yeah, I'm, uh, I've been very, very impressed by all of this. Um, I just wish I could have seen it all in the flesh, really. Yeah, um, to get my hands on that, but um, yeah, <laughs> beautiful. absolutely stunning. Thank well you, done. Gavin. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, guys. From West Hurts College. Thank you very much. It was very good. Brilliant. We're glad you enjoyed yeah, it. We right. did. A lovely comment from the Dorchester chef, Shravanan, Hello. just said um, that we executed, executed the event beautifully. So well done, you. <laughs> well done, Neil. Well done to all that cooked. Well done, you know, to all that took part. And we, we'll love to, you know, do a large sort of full quarterly event at some point when we're allowed again. You know, we'd love to invite you down and, and do more actually face to face. But for now, I hope this is a uh, suffice. Beautiful. I'll send some photos. Thank you very much. Too. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Excellent. Very good. good guys. Thank you. Keep Thank the social media me. going, guys. Tell everyone yep. what you've done. Thank you, Sam. Thank, Thank you very much. I'll be honest straight away now. Thank you very much, guys. And enjoy your weekends, guys. Yes. Yeah, you Thank too. Thank you so much. And take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye bye, thank you. And